Today I'm going to take you on a journey of how we've used the model system um, to interrogate a process about chromatin, uh, the microenvironment around DNA, and how by using an organism, a model system like C. elegans, we use this as a way to understand the physiological mechanisms of how this enzyme works. And then we began to interrogate the same types of question in human cells. And then through a large collaborative effort with Gaddy Getz and a variety of others, we've now moved this into the space of cancer genomics. And then ultimately our goal now is of, of clinical collaborators here, um, we're going to start moving this into the context of looking at drug resistance and so on, which I'll begin to highlight as we go through. But the main, the main, the main point for this story is here. It's illustrated in these two different ways. I, I, I like this one as a, a, a rendering better. But what it basically, what I'm going to tell you about is how we've identified an enzyme, and it's, I think, the first documented enzyme in the human genome that is able to actually cause site-specific copy regulation. And it results in the generation of amplified regions of very specific regions throughout the genome, and many of which have been implicated in drug resistance in multiple myeloma, ovarian cancer, and a variety of others as well. And so what I'm going to tell you about is how this enzyme, which is a lysine demethylase, which modulates that microenvironment around the DNA, what it does is it allows you to get specific fragments or specific regions. And so here's a picture that basically depicts this. Here's the two parental alleles, and then you see this unique region that's gained. Before telling you about any of this, I have to uh, really highlight the functional unit of the lab. It's this, this core folks here. Uh, without these people, I wouldn't be able to tell you anything. This has been primarily pioneered by an outstanding postdoc in the laboratory. We've had incredible collaborators from Nick Dyson's lab, Gaddy Getz's lab, and a variety of others as well. So for the, since this really hasn't been introduced here, and you're going to hear some more work uh, coming from new therapies targeting the, the epigenome per se, I want to kind of highlight some things to think about. Chromatin is a highly ordered structure. It's a nucleic acid. Basically, it's your DNA. It becomes wrapped and packaged in this very dense, protein-rich environment. In this very a nucleic acid-rich protein environment, you create like a, a very specific microenvironment, and it creates a very specific structure. So there's two features that I want to highlight as we go through is classically when people think of the epigenome or they think of the nucleus, the first thing that's thought about is the gene and the gene control mechanism, that genes are on or genes are off, and then in disease or development, you turn these things on and off. But what I'd like to do is highlight something that's very important here, is that you also have this other key aspect of the genome, which is the structural integrity, or you'll hear me refer to as more of an infrastructure. So you have chromosomal morphology, you have the chromosomes take shape, they have very distinct patterns, and also it's the combined efforts of these two events which result in proper gene control. They also then result in cell fates, tissues, and an organism. At the same time, in cancer what happens, and we often think about this because many of the activators or regulators or repressors we think about alter genes involved in oncogenesis, they alter specific genes. But we know that in cancer, one of the major features is this hallmark of chromosomal instability, aberrant chromosomal events. And so what I'd like to do today is paint a picture for you that illustrates that there are enzymes that are very important in modulating genes, but there are enzymes that are very, very important in this infrastructure. And that those enzymes may actually play key features in setting up this massive instability or the initiating events of instability that could result in drug-resistant models or potentially lead us to think about novel therapeutic application. And so just to highlight this, this top panel kind of shows you a, textbook, a, a textbook view of what we typically think about when genes, if I say genes and we think about epigenomes or we think about epigenetics or chromatin regulation, the first thing that comes to mind typically is how do the methylation or the regulation of histones or that environment around genes set. So there's often certain modifications which are linked to active regulation, such as this lysine 4 trimethylation. There's those that are linked to repression here. Notice that the lysines are very exquisitely specific. And this is something, if you don't take anything else home from this talk, it's that not all lysines within these proteins are created equal. They're all different. And they're linked to very specific consequences. In addition, the degree of methylation on these residues 
can give you very different and distinct outcomes. And so where they're physically placed is also very important. So for example, if you slide over this modification into the body of a gene, you find that it's typically linked to active um, transcription and induced genes. Then there are others that are restricted to the three prime end. But this is only for coding genes. So this is representing, you know, as we look at the genome, about 1%. What about the rest? There are many different other places. And so what you find is that there's clear positions in the genome, such as heterochromatin, which is this dense structure in this electron micrograph, which is on the uh, periphery in this inner area. Then you have this gray space, which is your eurochromatin region. And these are marked by distinct methylation states, dis distinct uh, lysine residues that are methylated. In this case, heterochromatin is marked in, and it always be red in the resume near the top, euchromatin is always green. It replicates later, it copies its DNA later, it's highly enriched in K9 trimethylation on this particular histone. And more importantly, it's highly decorated with a very specific set of heterochromatin proteins, which help create this dense environment. Whereas if you look at euchromatin, it tends to have differential levels of these two modifications or this binding protein. And these typically replicate earlier or later, depending on kind of what the, the environment is around it. Now, what happens, though, is they're not just important in modulating genes or potentially imp in implicating in when you replicate your DNA, but they also play key features in this structure as well as a chromosome. Because if you mutate enzymes that are very important in modulating methylation on these lysines, you'll get telomeric fusions, you'll get breaks, you get increased cancer um, risk. And so what it begins to tell you is that by modulating a series of modifications linked to this kind of structural integrity or the kind of zip coding of the genome to specific regions, you can also start to influence the disease. So what is my laboratory interested in? We're interested in this more global question of how is it that chromatin regulators as well as known codings, which I don't have time to talk about, how these two kind of function together to allow a, a mother cell to give rise to two daughter cells, and in this process, partition regions of the genome, such as heterochromatin and euchromatin, to the exact same place. At the same time, they're repositioning that genomic sequence into the right place. They're also coordinating you know, when those genes are turned on, when those genes are turned off, but also when that DNA is copied. So <clears throat> you can imagine, you can visualize RNA being generated through RNA polymerase as one major train. You take DNA polymerase and the generation of the DNA as another major train. If you dysregulate these two events and you don't regulate them properly, it's like two colliding um, trains, which is not very good for the cell. And so we're very interested in understanding, you know, how does that microenvironment, that chromatin state influence this? Because ultimately we believe this is going to give us key insights into genome stability, cell cycle control, and also how cells are actually monitoring or activating or repressing DNA damage response pathways. And so we kind of got into this because the enzymes that we're looking at are very important in modulating heterochromatin, that highly dense material that replicates later. And so the, methylite, the methylation that we were interested in is then regulated by a series of enzymes, and it's KDMs for lysine demethylases, which then are also balanced by a series of lysine methyl transferases. So my lab has initially started focusing on lysine demethylases, but many of the paradigms that I'm going to tell you about today were expanding out around many other chromatin regulators that surround this process. And so in order for us to understand how this process becomes dysregulated in cancer, how is it that you change the fate of a cell? How is it that you get this instability and disease? How do you do this? So what we've tried to do is we started overlaying other principles onto the equation. We've started asking, how is it that in certain pathologies, altered expression levels or copy gains or losses, how do these two coordinate functionality. We've started annotating all nucleotide variants, germline as well as somatic, making them, expressing them, and putting them in the cells and looking at consequence. Simultaneously, we've been very interested and found more recently lots of regulatory networks feeding into modulating their activity or how they're functioning. So what we try to do is we try to interface these various inputs onto the various enzymes so that we can understand how is it in disease you just regulate these to kind of manipulate this process. And our ultimate goal is twofold. One is we'd like to understand if we can identify chromatin regulators that will serve as a novel biomarker for potential patient stratification. You might find that this becomes really important in the context of certain drug resistance as it starts to emerge. 
The other one, though, is if we understand how these variants or variations impact this through specific enzymes, we might be able to take advantage of conventional chemotherapies by redirecting them into that genetic background or under those certain kinds of conditions. Or secondly, we may be able to adapt novel therapeutics that are emerging from various pharmaceutical sources that target KMTs or KDMs or other enzymes. And so what I'm going to tell you about today is a story where we really began to explore, oops, we really began to explore how expression level and copy change of one particular demethylase, what does that do and how does that actually regulate this process? And then we began to find that it has a key role in a very specific context around genome stability. So the enzymes that I'm going to tell you about are the lysine demethylases that are the Jumanji class. They use iron, oxygen, and alpha ketoglutarate as cofactors. The initial class that was discovered in Yang Shi's lab while I was a postdoc is LSD1. And this, this is, so this would be uh, uh, KDM1. There's the KDMs that are over here. And then you'll hear later about the targeting of lysine methyltransferases because many of them are also dysregulated in cancer. And so this is the particular class we'll talk about. More specifically, we're going to talk about this particular set of enzymes, which are in this cascade of about 20 or so demethylases. They're the KDM4s or JMJD2s. There are four invertebrates. I have to apologize up front that I'll often switch between KDM4 or JMJD2A. Um, 2A is more like uh, my pet name for it. Um, it's the one that kind of, uh, kind of launched my career. And so basically, there are four of these invertebrates. And then we were very fortunate there's one in C. elegans. A couple features I want to highlight, because they're going to merge as we begin to talk about this, is they have different domains. They also have PhD and tutor domains. For those of you less familiar with this space, those are binding modules that recognize modified or unmodified histone tails. They help kind of bring or recruit the proteins or associated proteins to regions in the genome. And so what I'm going to tell you about are how these two particular enzymes, how JMJD2A or KDM4A, and how the C. elegans homolog have a very distinct uh, homologous function. So what we do in the lab is we take an approach where we take a very uh, simple genetics approach in C. elegans. We couple that to some genomics. We couple this to cytology-based approaches. At the same time, in the laboratory, we're coupling uh, proteomics, genomics, cell biology, a lot of cytology these days, and also some chemical screens. We build a molecular network here. We build a molecular network. We combine these together, and what it does is it gives us like a molecular sieve. And the ultimate goal here is that we get a very clear annotation of what these enzymes or related enzymes are doing. We then try to relate this into a clinical setting through our colleagues who are oncologists, pathologists, and so on. At the same time, we're also paralleling this data and looking at how the cancer genome may be affected by this process with our collaborator, Gaddy Gett. So the first data that kind of led us to understanding this enzyme is when we delete it in C. elegans or knock it down, we got increased DNA damage, increased instability. The instability is localized to two particular regions. This region here, which is the region where all stem cells or all nuclei that are arised that po uh, populate the germline come from. And then again, you get an enriched region here of damage, and this is the peak of homologous recombination. So in C. elegan germline biology, any aberrations that become evident here are amplified here. There's this wonderful checkpoint system in place at the bend. And any of those nuclei that are too damaged or too unstable will be shunted to tape apoptosis. And so what happens is in this animal, when you knock it out, you get increased damage, but you also see a boost in apoptosis, and it's restricted to this region. Now, this is important because there's one particular genetic variable that modulates this, and that is the enzyme or gene, P, it's only P53 homolog except one. And so if you block this or knock this out in these animals, you should technically rescue all downstream consequence. And so when you do that experiment, you actually, in fact, do rescue the apoptosis and those defects. So then what we did is we did a reverse screen, because what we really wanted to know is there a particular type of instability that's arising from manipulating the chromatin environment. So what emerged from this screen was ATL1, or it's ATR um, and vertebrates. And basically, it was the only kinase that we identified that actually could rescue the defect. So if you knock out ATM, you don't. But if you knock out ATR, you do. Now, ATR's main function, without damage or misregulation, is in replication kinase cascade. 
So this began to suggest that by losing this enzyme, we were destabilizing the genome, and it had something to do with replication. So we wanted to take a better look at this, so we subjected the C. elegans, both knockdowns or knockouts. The knockouts here, you find that they're more sensitive to replicative stress drugs. The same thing is true if you deplete the enzyme. So we wanted to get a clear visual as to what might be taking place, what might be going on. So we zoomed in more closely, did a pulse chase label experiment, in vivo labeling of replication. And what you find is that what you're looking for is if, a, if the nuclei are replicating slower, what's going to happen is they're going to contain more red and green floor. At the same time, what we're really looking for are regions where you get strong accumulation of both floors, giving you a yellow signal, a pseudo yellow. yellow. And what we basically found in this is in the knockouts, we got more red and green nuclei, but most importantly, we saw lots or massive increases in the number of these yellow regions. So what this began to tell us is in vivo, we were actually seeing delayed or altered replication. And so <clears throat> we were having increased susceptibility to the replicative stress drugs. We were having delayed um, replication. We went on to demonstrate for the first time that you could actually completely abolish this effect if you knocked out the specific heterochromatin protein, HPL2, here. And if you genetically deplete this, basically you could find that you could restore the animals back to nearly wild type process in the germline. So this began to establish for the first time that there was a distinct antagonism between a demethylase that modifies specific residues and something that reads or recognizes that type of chromatin state. But as I mentioned earlier, we're interested in C. elegans to guide us into understanding human biology, which then can take us into a clinical setting. So we went back here and annotated this, this map. We have this relationship here. So then we went back to our cellular models and we started asking, could we get any insights? So what we found is, in fact, just like the C. elegans, if you over, use, using the inverse experiment, if you overexpress the demethylase, James jd 2 a in particular, in fact, cells proceeded through S phase faster. And this, in fact, required catalytic activity. So in the worms, you knock it out, it becomes slower. In human cells, you overexpress it, it becomes faster. In fact, we could also recapitulate increased or altered sensitivities to replication stress drugs. And this becomes a very important slide for much of the work that's going on that I'll talk about today, is that, in fact, if you treat them with replicative stress and their increased expression, when you release them, they recover better. However, if you have a catalytic mutation, they're actually more sensitive, suggesting that variants or variations on this enzyme could change susceptibility to certain chemotherapeutics, which is a big uh, push in the laboratory. But one of the things that caught our attention in all this process is when we did the standard experiment, we just looked at asynchronous profiles. They were the same. Now, when you overexpress the enzyme, they're faster through rest, but yet their, their cell cycle profile is the same. This began to suggest to us there was a delay and so when doing the rest release experiments, we noticed it was somewhere in G2M. So now this opened up a question for us, is there some type of aberrant event that's going on there? So we had established a model where we could modulate replication timing through heterochromatin displacement and C. elegans. We had the exact same phenomena going on in human cells. We demonstrate that the regulation of this process is critical. But there was something that must be going on because the net proliferation was the identical when you overexpress the enzyme. So we wanted to ask, are we actually destabilizing the genome? And what's happening is that's where your checkpoint activates and you start to get this arrest profile. So uh, our first experiment, which actually when we did this was kind of slightly disappointing, we took cells that were diploid but transformed. We took them over a span of about a year, year and a half. We did sky G-banding. And what we found is that they were perfectly fine. There was no major genomic aberrations that were observable by these type of methodologies. At this point, the, the two people who were actually helping the postdoc in my lab and the postdoc in Nick's lab, they were like, okay, well, what, what should we do here? Well, we then went on to ask the simple question, well, maybe it's not that we're affecting globally, but since the demethylase is regulating timing of replication and regulating specific regions, especially heterochromatic regions, maybe there's a massive destabilization in those positions. So the first series of experiments that were done were these. And trying to tell two postdocs that come to you with all these commercial centromeric and telomeric probes that we should really go after a different region, it was quite remarkable. They actually did do this, and it was like, okay, we're going to do one more set. 
But what you see here is when you look at this, they're flat. There's no major changes at these Central America or Telomeric regions. However, when we looked at a cytoband that when we looked at our chip, C, or chip chip data, we found massive enrichment for. We found that we, in fact, were getting copy gains of this specific region and the demethylase background. Now, these were stable cells. They're expressing moderately over endogenous levels, so one to three fold. Now, this could be some genetic twist. It could be some strange aberration. So we went on to do the following experiment where we introduced transiently. Now, this is really important. All the, many of the experiments I'm going to tell you about, we introduced the enzyme transiently under 24 hours. So not, it's only one complete cycle. And we transiently introduced the enzyme. And when you do this, you can create the gain. And in this case, the red is the region of interest, the 1Q12. And this black is a different centromeric probe. And when you introduce a catalytic mutation of this, actually, you lose it. It doesn't create the gains anymore. If you delete recruitment modules, such as the Tudor domains, you actually don't have it anymore. So now we had a transient enzyme that could go in, create a site-specific gain of a region of the genome. It required catalytic activity, and it required a, required a chromatin binding module. So then we went on to ask, is this just a function of complete alteration of this methylation state? Because one idea would be that if you put in an enzyme in that removes these methylation states or alters this chromatin structure, could create the event. So we put in the other family members, and what we find is the only member that could do this is KDM4A, not the other family members. So it allowed us to identify a, a very beautiful um, intrinsic specificity. So then it could be that you know, the magic question is, is this actually happening at the DN around the DNA? Is it through that chromatin environment? So this is where a collaboration with David Alice became essential. We teamed up with David Alice's group, and basically, you introduce a methionine in the lysine position, and this will inactivate the methylation on that residue. So we introduced this in the lysine 9 position. We introduced this in lysine 36 position, 27, and we mutated other residues. And when you introduce these transiently, now this is important. We infect cells. We harvest under 24 hours. So we're looking at a one set of division. What you find is that K9 loss or K36 actually both create site-specific copy gain. And to highlight this point, we have probes in 1Q23.3, 1Q uh, uh, the telomere. So you can see that we're not affecting all of chromosome 1. It's a very specific site. And so by altering the two substrates for this enzyme, we could create copy gains or changes of 1Q12. However, something that was particularly interesting is if you manipulate K27, you don't get the effect. So it's not just all dysregulation of heterochromatic type states or the repressive type states, which methyl methylation of 27 is important for. We then went on to see if we could identify something that would antagonize this um, to establish balance. So right now we had enzyme recruitment, we had enzymatic activity, we had its specificity in the family, we had the sites which seemed to be important. So what we wanted to do is see if we can balance this effect. So we then introduced um, every single K9 methyl transferase um, that has been shown or documented, and we found that only one of them to date can actually counterbalance the demethylase. And when you put them in together, you can actually block or rescue the 1Q12 gains. So establishing a one-to-one -one dynamic. We then put in the heterochromatin protein, the one that is the ortholog or most similar to the C. elegans version. And what we find is just like what we had previously shown, where it could rescue the faster S that this enzyme creates or that faster replication or altered timing, we could demonstrate that by putting this in, and I like to think of it more as a helmet, it basically can block or protect against the demethylase, and it once again can rescue the defect. So now what we wanted to do is ask, you know, when are these copies gained? Because based on this prediction, we would assume that we must be doing this during S phase, since the enzyme is really exerting a strong effect during replication and the timing of this process. So we started doing a series of experiments to address this. The first thing that we did was we arrested cells in G1S. And when we first did this, the expectation was that we would see you know, these gains in a population of those cells. Well, what we actually found, as you can see here, is they go away. So we were a bit surprised by this, because we figured we'd have a baseline population of gain, and that as you arrested cells, then we could determine when they were kind of occurring 
and maybe there was selective pressure against them. What we actually found is that when you arrest them, they completely go away. We did a whole series of experiments to look to see if these gains were actually enriched in apoptosis and a variety of other things, and we don't see that. In fact, we find that these cells that have KDM4A are more resistant to genotoxic stresses. We then arrested them to see if maybe we were getting clearance here, and maybe there was, this was a damage cascade. And so then we arrested cells in late G2 by using a CDK1 inhibitor, which is before nuclear envelope breakdown occurs. And once again, the fragments are gone. So now we were really in a, we were in a really unique position because here we are, we have a clear site-specific gain, but now under G1S arrest or in uh, basically late G2, they're gone. So then Josh did a really important experiment, and I think this really opens up a whole new avenue of a way to look at this. Basically, we arrested the cells and released them. And what we found is as you arrest the cells in G1S and release, as soon as cells start to enter S phase, copy gain starts to emerge. And then as cells start to exit S phase, go to G2, they start to disappear. Now, this is one of the most exciting parts of what we're doing because this means that there's an active mechanism. There's something innately in the cell that can see copy gain and get rid of it. And so we have a huge screen and a lot of projects going on bioinformatically with Gaddy to identify what are those, in fact, processes or pathways that are essential in this equation. So what would be, you know, kind of our molecular basis for this? If it's happening in S phase and the demethylase is changing timing, you know, what could it be? So we took a proteomic-based approach, both endogenous and exogenous complexes, showing you the exogenous purifications from two independent preparations. What we found and we were super excited by is actually a massive enrichment in replication proteins. So this enzyme was not only a seeming to cause site-specific gains and required its chromatin module, but now when we purify it, it has all these major proteins involved in replication. Now, why is this important? Because in yeast genetics, it's been shown that many of these are critical for re-replication. So as you manipulate them, you can alter re-replication events. So now it opened up this question for us, is this enzyme potentially serving as a docking module, changing the state around it, bringing in these proteins, and by bringing in those proteins, you can change when you replicate or how much. So to kind of start to address this question, we shifted to a very much older methodology of cesium, cesium chloride um, radiant centrifugation. So when you basically make, D, when DNA is made, if you just put BRDU in, um, as it's replicated, it becomes labeled, and that gives it a certain weight. So on a sedimentation, it will go down further. If it re-replicates, both strands will be BRDU positive, and it will sediment even further. And so that would be right here on this curve. Now what's cool about this experiment is, and it's a very painful one, is that it shows the same thing we see with facts, that you have more cells, the ratio of um, replicated to non-replicated in the KDM4 background. So this is very similar to our rest release experiments we saw before. We don't see any peaks here, and that's consistent with the fact that when we do cyt cytological analysis, we're not seeing lots of abnormalities. So Josh did something that I, is just a, it was something that is super important for this. He actually pooled these fractions together, and then we simply asked, are regions that the KDM4 enzyme is actually bound to, that it regulates replication at, are in fact they modulated or are they re-replicated? And so here's the example. Chromosome 1SAT2 actually falls adjacent to or right just inside the 1Q12H band, the one that's copy gained. And in fact, you see re-replication occurring. Now what's interesting about this is XN is not. But XN, we showed, was also a KDM4 target. So what this began to immediately tell us was that not every single site that the enzyme occupies in the genome is actually re-replicated at certain positions. So then we went on to ask the question, if this is true, then is it through this recruitment of components? So you recruit these various components in, you alter methylation, and you alter HP1 density. So what we found is when you increase expression of the demethylase at satellite 2, you get enriched occupancy flat other places. You reduce the amount of K9 trimethylation, one of those residues that causes site-specific gain. We then demonstrate that you displace HP1 gamma, which was the uh, particular uh, chromatin binder that actually could block the effect. We actually found enrichment of DNA licensing, uh, replication licensing factors, MCMs, as well as DNA polymerase at our target. 
So what this began to do is establish a model by the enzyme almost either being a pseudo-orc or being able to create an environment where you could potentially use these origins that are within the human genome. So now the big question for us is, is this all trickery of cell lines? Is this just us doing a lot of manipulation to cell line, creating a cell line and, and luck? And so this is where our, our collaboration with Gaddy became instrumental. What we did in this case is this is looking at about 1,700 tumors from eight different tumor types. We've expanded this now, but this is the data at the time. We found that about 20% of the tumors we looked at as a whole had copy gains. The copy gains was actually um, associated with increased expression of the demethylase. There were a few reports out there in the literature that said the demethylase was higher in certain types of cancer, uh, squamous, cell carcin uh, squamous cell lung cancer. There was cases of breast, but just very limited cases and no reason. And so what this began to do is establish for us that there were specific copy gains, which was correlated expression. We then stratified this across the tumor types, and something that emerged beautifully was that we found that in the case of ovarian, 46% of the cases were actually amplified for KDM4A. So then what we did is we stratified the copy gains in this category down to focality. So we did, this is using gistic analysis from Gaddy's group, basically plus one, which is more like whole arm events of chromosomes, plus two is more focal. And what we found is the more focal, which also correlates with increased expression, that you have a enriched, uh, you have a uh, faster time to death. So worst outcome for those individuals. Now what's really remarkable about this is ovarian cancer, one of the prognostic markers for cisplatin resistance is a 1Q12, 1Q21 copy gain. And basically you get these gains that emerge. So this kind of caught our attention that, okay, I wonder if there are other cytobands outside of 1Q12. Could we use this type of tumor data set so we know that there are gains, we know that it's linking to diseases where some focal regions are very important. So what we then did is we did this really cool experiment where we took, we keyed off of KDM4A's you know, position in the genome, which is at 1P34, and we then asked the simple question, are there any other cytobands of the 807 that are co-gained with it? So the beauty of this is we knew that gain correlated with increased expression. We keyed this off of just over 4,000 tumors, 12 tumor types, and we started picking up very specific regions in the genome. And I'm going to highlight this one on X and chromosome 1 because this region on chromosome 1 is 1Q21. And from all the original data from Matt Myers and a variety of other labs, 1P34, 1Q21 are very common in cancer. But no one's been able to understand what's the relationship of these two particular regions that emerge. We also noticed that on this X region here, which are two main, two main cytobands, that if you looked at other cancers, such as ovarian, they became very sharp, very pronounced. And since chromosome 1 and X are very different, we decided to pursue them further to see if our hypothesis was right, that the enzyme was generating site-specific gain by using transgenic cell lines. Before doing this, though, we wanted to see if our, it was our, the, our analysis, and you can see that KDM4B is flat. So this is not true that our analysis was just enriching for one particular thing. So the take home point here is that we use transgenic cell lines. It makes no difference what cell type. We've done this now in a dozen or more cell types. We've even done it, started doing this in primary cells. And what I can tell you is if you introduce the enzyme, you can, you can get site specific copy gains of the regions. And in fact, we use probes tiling across this region to 1Q23, which is where it falls off statistically. And we find that you, in fact, can get site-specific gains of the regions, uh, which return to baseline. So there were site-specific copy gains. Now, one possibility is that this is an entirely amplified region. The whole region is amplified. But by tiling across it, we could do a comparative analysis and take a look at this. And so what I want to draw your attention to here is here's an example where we have, in, with the 1Q12 probe, they're co-gained, and you can see they're together. However, with the 1Q1221, which is this boundary going into point one, you see that here's a, here's a cell that has three, but this one only has two. So what this began to tell us is that there was heterogeneity within the cell population as well for the copy gains. And those of you that know pathology and look at some of the data that's out there, you'll notice that there's a degree of heterogeneity that occurs for copy gains in many tumors. And so what we begin to wonder is, is that heterogeneity actually something by manipulation of chromatin states or something that's being regulated, or is proliferation playing an impact, for example. So we then looked a little closer at this, and we looked at another probe, which is in 1Q21.2, 
which is right here at this dark side of band. And you notice that 1Q12H and 1Q21 are mutually exclusive. So if you sum all these regions that we ended up testing, the take home is that it encompasses all of S phase. And that these copy gains are occurring during this process of replication. We then wanted to know, is this actually something that's inside or embedded in the autosome, or is it, is it there? Is it co-traveling? Where is it? So we teamed up with Christina Montagna out of Einstein, and we did this interface uh, chromosomal paint for chromosome 1, which is in green. And then we used our 1Q1221 probe. And what you can find here is that here are your two mother and father alleles basically lighting up. But what we always find is that we get this either periphery or somewhere in this space but we never see this gain um, occurring in the green territory. And so this is very consistent with the model by which you're generating these re-replicated fragments, which are then turned over. So we went on then to ask it a little bit further and, and probe this a little deeper. We wanted to know if the same mechanism that we saw at the 1Q12 region was happening here. So we ended up doing the same type of analysis where we looked to see if if there was increased occupancy, and at all the targets that were re-replicated, you had increased KDM4 occupancy. At all the targets, we displaced heterochromatin. At all the targets, you increased licensing recruitment, as well as DNA polymerase. So basically, what we established in this model was that you could misregulate an enzyme, specifically, that could go in and perturb a methylation state, which would result in your ability to cause re-replication in very specific domains or regions in the genome. What this also begins to stress is that there's a particular chromatin environment that surrounds certain loci that are important for preventing or allowing re-replication or allowing site-specific copy gains. And we also know that this process can in fact be balanced by other factors opening up the possibility of drug ability or the ability to reverse or block the process. So some highlights from this work are that the KDM4A enzyme, the lysine demethylase, is overexpressed. It does not cause major chromosomal instability, as some might have predicted. KDM4A is overexpressed and promotes site-specific copy gain and re-replication. This can, in fact, be balanced by reestablishing SU39 or HP1 gamma. And something that's really intriguing is that you can manipulate K9 or K36 methylation status and generate the same phenotype, which would suggest there are probably other enzymes out there that can do this process. We know that, in fact, now KDM4 is amplified in certain types of tumors, and that this also is associated with specific co-gained regions, that you can then go back and recapitulate these same events in transgenic cells, which gives you the ability to kind of look for this in different cell types or different backgrounds. And probably the coolest part, I think, is that we, it demonstrates for the first time that there's actually an enzyme capable of directing site-specific copy gain. So now this process of just random selection of regions, may, it's probably partly true in certain cases, but this also opens up another avenue of putting a name and a face together for a process. So, thanks. So I can see quite clearly how this is relevant for cancer. I can't quite appreciate why the organism has this mechanism. Why would you have an enzyme that controls in a local way specific parts of the genome, whether they re-replicate or not? You're asking, so this, is, this has been the quest over the past several months now of see if, to determine if, in fact, one, it's physiological. Are there processes that could stimulate this process? process naturally. And then the million dollar question is, is what would be the benefit to the cell if it does actually happen? So the first part is we've done a series of screens to identify whether triggers could cause site-specific gain. And to answer that question is yes, we can actually see that there are certain input signals that can come into a cell and you can drive site-specific gain. So we be believe actually this is a physiological process that does occur. The second part that we've started to look at is what would be the benefit. So if you look at the literature around 1Q21, especially in ovarian, one of the things that people have noticed is that certain genes, anti-epitotics in particular, or pro-survival genes, become upregulated when they're in those cytobams. So one possibility is that under certain conditions of stress, cells have come up with a way to generate these regions 
to handle those events or certain physiological input signals, they can generate these events. And so what cancer has done is they basically use that system to protect itself. So that's one possibility. The other one, which is my more fantasyful world, is that DNA fragments themselves are really important in the sense that DNA fragments themselves can kind of agitate the cell and almost create an internal immune response. The cell becomes agitated, it can increase its p53 levels or it can increase its damage response pathways and be ready to deal with those consequences. Consistent with that notion, if you take a diploid cell that's got stable p53, what you find is that you increase the stability of p53, but it's not at, to the level that it would be if you give genotoxic stress. So and it still allows it, when you put genotoxic stress, to ramp up all the downstream cascades. So these are two possibilities and these are two areas that the lab is actively interrogating. Bruce. So one implication of this is, would be that the cell is constantly overduplicating certain areas of the chromosome or uh, of the genome so that uh, in the event of stress it can protect itself. And have you tried to look at the profile of amplification in the presence or absence of cytotoxic drugs that are associated with amplification, such as our old friend methotrexate? Yeah. Or so a lot of this dates back to when I was a PhD student and in, in studying methotrexate resistance. So one of the things that you get is amplification, focal amplification of DHFR. Um, and then what also intrigued me is in the case of diseases linked to the 1Q21, it's cisplatin resistance, and this emerges in many different cancer types. So to kind of address this, we're taking a series of genotoxic drugs that have been associated with certain focal gains of certain regions, and we're subjecting them to um, selection and also putting certain genetic backgrounds there to see if we can enrich for them. Do all of a sudden now we uncouple something where we can get integrative events, and you know, or do we see resistance starting to emerge? These are all early, early stages, but so far, the data looks kind of promising, actually. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look and see. Hopefully, that'll be the case. Yeah, Jonathan, can you comment a little bit more on the data you got with the uh, H3K36 uh, mutant histones? Does the uh, phenotype look pretty much exactly the same as what you get with the K9 mutants? And can, do you have any idea what the machinery involved is? Is it something you're investigating? It's a, it's a great question. So, um, so for K36, we are the screen is underway to determine what would be the corresponding lysine methylase that could be involved. Um, and we're particularly interested in this because, you know, multiple myeloma, 1Q21, is often gained. Um, so we're screening every methylase that we know. We're also screening other methylases we don't know now as well. Um, we don't know who it is at this time. Um, I don't think it's the one that everybody may have initially suspected. So, uh, but those studies may be a little early. We're also making sure that Maybe for the methylases, it's more important what the cell background is. So uh, since we now we know we can generate this in a variety of conditions, we're now kind of pan screening that process. Yeah. Um, uh, my question was about how uh, general this relationship will be, or how unique uh, GemJD2 to A will be. Yep. Uh, and because um, on the one hand, you might imagine that anything that affected K9 methylation would show a similar association, yep. or you might think that it's only something that affects replication is able to recruit replication proteins. Right. So to address this question, we, we since our um, genomics analysis of the cancer genome was, was so powerful, and it seems to show very really nice, we've taken that same analysis now and applied it to every KMT, every KDM, most readers, we're moving this to most regulators of the genome. And what I can tell you is now, by expanding this out to a huge number of enzymes, there are many that look like KDM4B, which affects lysine 9, if it looks at it affects 36. They're flat. There are others, certain groups, that seem to emerge very strong. So now those become really good candidates to ask, are they causing it? So transgenically, now we're creating cells and going back for those modifiers or those regulators or binders and asking if they do the same process. Um, and so what I can tell you is that it's not always 1Q21. It seems like there's other regions. So this may be that there's certain regions that have an altered propensity for this event. I just want to ask a question that sort of is relevant to someone asking about the physiological relevance of this. Yep. You mentioned that when you upregulate this enzyme, you don't upregulate it by very much. It's only maybe the order of a couple fold. Right. So what is this normal regulation? Uh, do you find it changing during the cell cycle? Is it upregulated in this phase by factor two or so? Yeah, so I, I, yeah, I kind of jumped over that a little. 
So this is what this is actually how we uh, first pin KDM4A as the ortholog of JMJD2 and C elegans to regulate S phase. So if you take cells and you look at S phase and you arrest, release, and you do time courses, KDM4A is very high in G1S, goes down very strong to the lowest levels in G2M, then it recycles back. So it's regulated through the SCF complex. So call one and associate F boxes tightly, tightly regulate its expression. Transcriptionally, we see no it's it's pretty flat across all cell lines we've tested. So it's at a, it's at this ubiquitination and turnover mechanism. All right, phenomenal questions. Thank you very much. All right, I thanks. Think